Let us now welcome the members of the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, faculty headed by their respective executive committees, led by the University Faculty Marshal, Dr. Jose D. D. Camacho, Jr., Dean of the Graduate School. Dr. Eufemio T. Rasco, Academician, National Academy of Science and Technology. Dr. Eleno O. Peralta, Director, Office of Student Affairs. Dr. Ruben L. Villarreal, former UPLB Chancellor. Dr. Emil Q. Javier, former Minister of Science and Technology, former UP President, former UPLB Chancellor. Dr. Dolores A. Ramirez, University Professor Emeritus and National Scientist. Assistant to the Vice Chancellor, Professor Julieta A. De Los Reyes, Assistant Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs. Please welcome the UPLB Executive Committee members, Dean Elpidio M. Agdisit Jr. of the College of Agriculture and Food Science, Dr. Felino T. Lansigan of the College of Arts and Sciences. Dean Isabelita M. Pabuayon of the College of Economics and Management. Dean Arnold R. Elepano of the College of Engineering and Agroindustrial Technology. Dean Willie P. Abasolo of the College of Forestry and Natural Resources. Dean Raden G. Piadozo of the College of Human Ecology. Dean Decibel F. Eslava, School of Environmental Science and Management. Please also welcome Dr. Yolanda T. Garcia, Director Simplicio M. Medina, 
Director Suliza C. Sagigit, Vice Chancellor Shirley B. Hamyas, Vice Chancellor Marish S. Madlangbayan, Vice Chancellor Crisanto A. Dorado, Vice Chancellor Portia G. Lapitan. Let's also welcome the members of the Board of Regents, Honorable Frederick Mikael Spocky I. Farolan, Honorable Angelo A. Jimenez. Carrying the University of the Philippines Los Baños Mace is the University Registrar, Dr. Mirna G. Carandang. The Chancellor of the University of the Philippines Los Baños, Dr. Fernando C. Sanchez, Jr. Carrying the University of the Philippines Mace is the Secretary of the Board of Regents and the UP System, Attorney Roberto M. J. Lara. The President of the University of the Philippines, Attorney Danilo L. Concepcion. Chairman of the Board of Regents, Honorable J. Prospero E. Tevera III. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please also welcome the Nobel Laureate in Physiology or Medicine in 1993, our honoree, Sir Richard J. Roberts. Let us all please stand for the entry of colors, the national anthem of Great Britain, and the Philippine national anthem.
Please be seated. Dr. Eufemio T. Rasco, academician, National Academy of Science and Technology, Philippines, will introduce our honoring. Sir uh, Richard John Roberts, Honorable uh, Prospero de Vera III, Chairman of the Board of Regents of the University of the Philippine System, President Danilo uh, Concepcion, President, University of the Philippine System, Chancellor Fernando Sanchez Jr., Chancellor of UP Los Baños, faculty members of uh, UP Los Baños, students, uh, guests, ladies and uh, gentlemen. It is my privilege to introduce uh, our honoree this afternoon, who will be conferred the degree of the Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. He is notably the 1993 Nobel Prize laureate in the field of physiology or medicine. I wish to congratulate the University of the Philippines for the initiative to honor Sir Roberts in this manner. Thank you also for giving me the privilege of sharing the same stage as this great man of science. My role is to present the man and his deeds, to give you some idea of what kind of a person he is. I'm afraid this is going to be a bit long, but I hope you will understand that I'm covering all of his 75 years in a few minutes. I had the privilege of listening to his account of his personal journey that led to the Nobel Prize two days ago when he spoke during a symposium in Manila. So let me share you my impressions. If there are any inaccuracies, I hope Sir Roberts will be forgiving. His life is so inspiring, I had to restrain myself from preparing a four-hour introduction. Well, first, let's talk about the man. He's British, lived and worked in America for all of his professional life, married an American, but resisted all suggestions to be an American citizen, although he is eminently qualified. So he still carries the British passport, but unfortunately he lost his British accent. He admits being blue, nevertheless, as an admirer of Democrats. He said he wears two rings, the smaller one is his wedding ring. But this, not, this does not really show his priorities, at least that is what he tells to his wife, Jean. He is an unrepentant video game player. Fortunately, he did not excel in snooker in spite of his passion for it. So the world gained a Nobel Prize laureate instead of a world champion in snooker. He is an atheist, according to one internet source, but I don't see any sign that God is actually angry with him. Indeed, the Nobel Prize is only his first recognition. There were many others that followed, among them is being knighted by the British government. This earned him the privilege of being called Sir Richard Roberts. It is easy for us to identify with him, not the least because we traditionally call our professors Sir. Like many of his generation, he came from a humble beginning in Derby, England. His family then moved to a town called Bath, which of course is Los Baños in Spanish. That, of course, sounds familiar. 
His father, John Roberts, was a mechanic. His mother, Edna Alsop, a homemaker. He was born in 1943, his parents' only child, during World War II. I imagine his early life was not exactly a very pleasant or quiet one. During wartime, food has to be rationed and everything else is scarce. He recalls that on the day he was born, German planes tried to bomb a military facility in the next town, but the bombs missed by at least seven kilometers and nearly killed his family. For this reason, he considers himself lucky and throughout his talk in Manila the other day, he repeatedly credited luck for his success. He was booked in one of the planes that terrorists hijacked and crashed during 9-11, but luckily he had to cancel at the last minute. But luck was important not only for keeping him alive, but more significantly for shaping his mind. He was lucky to have outstanding mentors in every stage of his life. His parents gave him good genes and taught him hard work and curiosity, the two most important traits that led to his success. His grade school mathematics teacher made him love mathematics, a subject that many others love to hate. Later in his university and postgraduate studies, he was lucky to have been associated with very supportive mentors, among them famous names in molecular biology. Thus, he had all the conventional elements for success as a scientist. Curiosity, hard work, good mentors, and he always adds luck. If I may add, his passion for simplicity, which kept him working on simple organisms such as the bacteria. He also reads a lot, even materials that are outside his field of, ex of expertise. He is convinced that good ideas can be found even in a completely unrelated field. By the way, I never believed the luck part. I think he was just being modest. I believe in hard work, and the evidence for this is the bigger of his two rings. If you are now beginning to believe that his life was smooth sailing, you are completely wrong. He failed his physics exam on the first try. He applied for admission in several universities, four I recall, but only one gave him admission, that is Sheffield University. Happily, it was his first choice because of its strong chemistry department. He eventually specialized in organic chemistry under Professor David Ollis a professor he said he truly admired. His research career changed to molecular biology when he read the book, Thread of Life, by John Kendrio, and he ended up working for his boss doc with Jack Strominger at Harvard. In his words, the four years at Harvard where everyone talked in acronyms like DNA, RNA, were wonderful. After postdoc, he, he, he wanted to return to Britain, and he applied for a position at the University of Edinburgh. Unfortunately, his application was ignored. So he ended up working at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory for Jim Watson. Everybody knows him, the famous DNA man. Jim Watson hired him after a 10-minute job interview during which Jim Watson did all the talking. He survived 20 years working with Watson, even as there were times Watson really wanted to fire him. I guess Jim Watson realized he was too good to deserve being fired. He was nominated four times. I can imagine rather reluctantly by Jim Watson before he got the Nobel Prize. 
He is an ordinary mortal as far as journal editors are concerned. In one case, the publication of his scientific paper was delayed because he used the word amazing in the title. Well, uh, the editors must have thought uh, it doesn't sound very technical, and they wanted to remove it. But he argued passionately, so he was allowed to retain the word amazing. It was in this manner that the word amazing made its way into the title of a scientific journal, probably for the first and only time. That tells you how amazing his work really was. He purposely defies tradition for the sake of accuracy. That is a mark of a true scientist. His professional accomplishments are widely known, so I will leave that for you to explore. There's a lot in Wikipedia. For this occasion, I only wish to recall the citation for the Nobel Prize that he shared with Philip Allen Sharp. Sir Robert is best known for his co-discovery of split genes and mRNA splicing. He uncovered the complexities of mRNA structure and function, highlighting the inherent links between disease onset and complications in gene splicing and intron removal from interrupted genes. These discoveries paved the way for many products, including those that eventually benefited healthcare and our own farmers. There are many Nobel Prize laureates, but what makes him truly exceptional in my mind is the rare combination of entrepreneurial and scientific mindsets. He first showed this when he suggested to Jim Watson to commercialize products of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories Research to generate funds to, re to support research. But much to Watson's regret later, he rejected the idea, believing they will only lose money. This led Sir Robert to accept an offer in 1992 to help establish the New England Biolabs, a reagent company. Today, he still works for that company, and it's now the world's leader in discovery and supply of reagents for molecular biology. It was not love, it was not for love of money. It is to generate profits that would allow him to support his passion for basic research. I think this is one lesson that we in the science community can learn from Sir Roberts. We need not be dependent on external fund sources for basic research. If we can create spin-off activities to allow us to generate funds, as he suggested, for the Cold Springs Harbor Laboratory. Another lesson worth remembering is he always allocated some research money for research activities he wanted to do, but research bureaucracy does, does not want to fund because they, not, they do not fall into their priorities. He engaged in what uh, we may call technically uh, malversation of funds. Using money allocated for the milking cow research to explore new ideas that research bureaucrats have not learned to appreciate. I think it should be all right to tell this to you now because Jim Watson is not listening. He is still busy, I heard, creating controversies and creating enemies at age 90 plus. But I think the most important lesson that we can learn from Sir Roberts is his commitment to a higher cause, a cause that is beyond science. It is his commitment to humanity. He demonstrated this when he led a group of 138 Nobel Prize laureates in 2016 to sign a manifest manifesto of support for precision agriculture or GMOs, specifically golden rice, in the light of widespread disinformation being spread by cost-oriented groups. Without mincing words, 
the paper accused those engaged in false information about GMOs, Greenpeace specifically, of committing crimes against humanity. It's a direct quote. These are brave words and brave deeds. Makes me wonder how many of our own scientists would be willing to stick their neck out in this manner. During this era of fake news, the public needs guidance from reliable sources. Nothing can be more reliable than Nobel Prize laureates. Therefore, on behalf of the rice-eating Filipinos, I salute you, Sir Richard Roberts. You are an outstanding role model and inspiration for scientists. We will be proud to have you as an honorary doctoral alumnus of the University of the Philippines. I call upon the Secretary of the Board of Regents and the members of the Board of Regents of the University of the Philippines, Secretary of the Board of Regents, Attorney Roberto M. J. Lara, Regent Frederick Michael Spaki Farolan, Regent Angelo A. Jimenez, President Danilo L. Concepcion and the Chairman of the Board of Regents, Dr. J. Prospero E. De Vera III. I call upon Sir Richard J. Roberts of Great Britain. Babasahin natin ang citation para kay Sir Richard Roberts. Alang-alang sa kanyang bukod-tanging mga napagtagumpayan bilang molecular biologist, isang fellow ng Royal Society at Nobel Prize laureate para sa Fisiologia o Medisina noong taong isang libo siyam na raan, siyam na put tatlo. Alang-alang sa kanyang buong buhay na pag-aaral na partikular na nakatuon sa deoxyribonucleic acid o DNA, ang materyal na nagsasalin ng mga katangiang henetiko sa lahat ng uri ng buhay. Alang-alang sa kanyang pangunahing pag-aaral na nagbunga sa kauna-unahang molecular scissors sa mundo na tinatawag din restriction enzymes. Ang mga enzyme na ito na mula sa bakterya ay ginagamit upang paghati-hatiin ang DNA na nagpapadali sa pag-aaral nito at sa pagkilala at pagtukoy sa mga gene. 
alang-alang sa kanyang pagsasaliksik na naghawan sa landas tungo sa pagmanipula ng DNA na nagbunga ng pambihirang tagumpay sa recombinant DNA, genetic engineering, at iba pang uri ng genetic research. Alang-alang sa kanyang pagkakatuklas sa split genes at RNA splicing na nagpabago sa takbo ng genetic research at nagbigay daan sa napakahalagang pagsulong sa maraming larang mula sa pagpapalahi ng mga halaman hanggang sa saliksik ukol sa kanser. Alang-alang sa kanyang pag-aaral na naghawan ng landas tungo sa pagtukoy sa mga sakit tulad ng sickle cell anemia at Huntington's disease sa level ng DNA. Gayun din, mga pathogenic bacterial strain na banta sa, kasul- sa kalusugan at buhay ng mga tao at hayop gaya ng methicillin-resistant S. aureus. Alang-alang sa kanyang mga kasulukuyang pagsisikap na himukin ang green peas at iba pang samahang kontra GMO na itigil ang kampanya laban sa genetically modified organisms sa pamamagitan ng kanyang Nobel Prize platform na hikayat niya ang isang daan tatlumput walupang Nobel laureate na suportahan ang ligtas sa paggamit ng recombinant technology bilang kasangkapan sa pagpapabuti ng mga uri ng halaman. Alang-alang sa lahat ng ito, ginagawaran si Sir Richard J. Roberts si titulong nitong titulong pandangal bilang angkop na pagkilala para sa kanyang natatanging mga ambag sa pagsusulong ng agham na nagbunga ng hindi mabilang na benepisyo sa sangkatauhan, sa larang ng medisina at pagpapabuti ng mga uri ng halaman upang higit na matugunan ang pagpapakain at pagbibigay sustansya sa mamayan ng mundo. I will now read the citation in English. For his outstanding achievements as a molecular biologist, a fellow of the Royal Society, and a Nobel Prize laureate for physiology or medicine in 1993, for his life work which focused particularly on the deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA, the material that transfers genetic characteristics in all life forms, for his groundbreaking work that resulted in the world's first molecular scissors called restriction enzymes. These enzymes isolated from bacteria are used to cut DNA into fragments, making it easier to study DNA and identify and characterize genes. For his work that paved the way to manipulate DNA, resulting in breakthroughs in recombinant DNA, genetic engineering, and other forms of genetic researches, for his groundbreaking discovery of split genes, and subsequently RNA split splicing, that changed the course of genetic research and has led to momentous progress in many fields of plant breeding to cancer research, for his discovery that led to the identification of diseases at the DNA level, uh, such as the sickle cell anemia and the Huntington's disease, as well as pathogenic bacterial strains that are, that are threats to humans and animals, such as the methicillin resistant S. aureus or MRSA, for his recent efforts to urge Greenpeace and other anti-GMO groups to stop their campaign against genetically modified organisms, through his Nobel Prize platform, he persuaded 138 other Nobel laureates to support the safe use of recombinant technologies as a tool for improving plant varieties. For all these, Sir Richard J. Roberts is being conferred this honorary degree as a fitting recognition of his outstanding contributions to the advancement of science, which redounded to innumerable benefits to humankind in the field of medicine and improving plant varieties to better feed and nourish the peoples of the world. The Board of Regents of the University of the Philippines 
upon the recommendation of the President of the University and the Committee on Honorary Degrees confer upon the Honorable Sir Richard J. Roberts the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa. The University of Philippines in testimony of this conferment of the highest rank and honor within its gift hereby presents to him this diploma and this vestment of distinction on, the, on this 21st day of November in the year 2018, signed Danilo L. Concepcion, President, attested Roberto M. J. Lara, Secretary of the University of the Board of Regents. Well, I'm overwhelmed. Um, Chancellor, Board of Regents, faculty of the University of the Philippines, students, this is an unbelievable honor. I, I have been awarded one or two honorary degrees previously, but none have touched me quite as much as this one. <clears throat> So I thank you from the bottom of my heart for this great honor. It is something I will remember for the rest of my life, which I hope is going to be a long time. I don't want to say much more because you now unfortunately have to listen to me give you a lecture about GMOs. The reason that this was so important to me is because of the fact that the Philippines, and in particular, Erie within the Philippines, and the Department of Agricultural Biology here in the university have done so much to try to help the rest of mankind, and they have not been rewarded properly for it. I think the original idea to develop golden rice was just an amazing feat, and to see what has happened since then was really very disturbing to me. Can we get the slides up and I'll, uh, I'll get started on the lecture. So what I'm going to do in this lecture is to tell you how I got involved in the GMO great point, in the GMO enterprise in the first place to give you some idea of what we have been trying to do as Nobel laureates and to make a strong case as to why 
we should put much more effort into convincing the politicians, the political leaders around the world of the necessity of supporting GMOs and not listening to the naysayers who are not telling the truth. I got started because I was invited to a symposium celebrating the 80th birthday of Dr. Mark Van Montague. That is the gentleman on the left and the right at the top. And he and Jeff Schell in Belgium, as well as Mary Del Chilton in the US, had discovered a natural way in which DNA could be transferred from bacteria into plants. This was a completely natural process. They didn't invent it. Nature invented it. But as soon as they worked out what the mechanism was, they realized that this could be used to improve plant breeding in ways that the plant breeders would have loved to have had 100 years ago. After the talk at the symposium, I listened for a day to plant biologists telling me how difficult it was for them to work in Europe and do their plant research when it involved GMOs. The anti-GMO movement that had been led by Greenpeace would stage demonstrations, both within the lecture halls where they were teaching as well as outside. They would try to get them fired from their universities. They would try to stop funding going to these researchers. And it was very sad to hear this. The following day, I had been invited to talk to the European Commission about the future of medicine. I prepared a few slides talking about vaccination and various other things. But I decided that I would actually take a different tack, and the night before I prepared a talk that I will amplify during this one. Basically, I made the case that if you lived in the West, in one of the developed countries, then medicine that cost a lot of money and that was at the cutting edge of what was possible was fine. People had the money, they could afford it. But if you lived in the developing world, your requirements were very different. For the 800 million people who go to bed hungry every night, food is medicine. And so this was the message that I tried to give to the European Commission. In the developing countries, medicines have to be cheap. Practical solutions are needed. None of the fancy stuff that is required in the West. Once you realize that food is medicine for hungry people, I think it gives you a new perspective on just how important food is, not just in the developing countries, but in the developed countries too. Uh, where we have lots of food, we're now studying problems of obesity. People are eating too much, they're getting fat. That's not a big problem in the developing countries, it is a problem in the US, it's a problem in Europe. You don't see many thin Europeans. After the talk, an Italian senator came up to me and said she'd never heard this side of the story that I had given and that I'm going to give to you before. And she had been totally opposed to GMOs because she'd been listening to Greenpeace and the commercialization, the, the commercials, the advertising, the scare stories that they were disseminating. And she said, after listening to me, she had changed her mind. And she wanted now to support GMOs. And it occurred to me that maybe here was an opportunity to do something. And so what I did, I went and talked to some of my Nobel friends. I, I know many of the Nobel laureates because I've organized them for different sorts of campaigns previously. And I said, would you be interested in supporting this? Is this something you would feel strongly about? And the first few that I talked to said, absolutely. Let's get on board, let's do it. I slowly thought about what was the best strategy to do this. 
by talk to more Nobel laureates, and by the middle of June, or the end of June in 2016, I had more than 100 laureates who all said, yes, we will join you in supporting GMOs. I held a press conference in Washington. We got a lot of press, um, an enormous amount of press around the world. And we sent a letter to Greenpeace and to the head of every delegation from every country at the United Nations saying GMOs are safe. There is no evidence whatsoever that GMOs are dangerous. There has not been a single credible problem caused by GMOs since they were first introduced. And in particular, we called upon Greenpeace to stop pretending they were dangerous, accept the science. They claim to be a scientific organization, accept the science. They are not fools. They must know that every piece of scientific evidence says that GMOs are safe. This was the advertisement that we put up. You'll see basically the letter on the left. I updated the number because we now have 138 Nobel laureates signed on. And I think soon we will have more because as you're probably aware, there was a recent crop of Nobel laureates came up. Until December 10th, they're far too busy trying to prepare to go to Stockholm. But after that, they will have more time and I will contact each one of them and ask them to join us. The cartoon on the right was put together by a gentleman in Iowa. And it just points out that on the left, you have basically the anti-GMO movement trying to scare everybody, saying, do you know what these things can do to you? Well, I can tell you, the little boy on the right has the right answer. It can allow me to live. This is where I can get my food. Now, of course, because so many people live in cities, they cannot grow their own food in the backyard, and we need big agriculture. And this turns out to be a problem, and this fact alone that we have big agribusinesses like Monsanto, like Syngenta, now Bayer, going out and growing on a huge scale and being a commercial business trying to make as much money as possible from food. And unfortunately, Monsanto did not roll out their GMO products in a way that was helpful. Now, before I get into the politics of all of this, I just want to take a little while so that those of you who are not completely familiar with plants and plant breeding and the differences between traditional breeding and the way that, the, that one can do it using GMOs, I would ask you to take a look at this. Almost all of you have seen these beautiful corn cobs that you buy in the supermarkets that taste good. They're huge. But the precursor of that was this skinny thing on the extreme left. If I can find the pointer, well, the skinny thing on the, th on the left is called teosinte. This was the original corn. Now you'll notice these yellow corn cobs don't look anything like it. And the reason they don't is because in Central America and then later in the US, these were bred to produce better and better plants. And some of the intermediates are shown across the way there. This was all accomplished by genetic modification. Not GMOs, but straight genetic modification, which is what the plant breeders do all the time. This is what conventional breeding looks like. You'll see we have what we call an elite variety. This is the plant that we're growing in the fields and that we make, um, make the food that we eat. Now, let's say you wanted that to grow a little taller, or you wanted it to produce a bigger grain if it was wheat. What you can do is you can find a natural variety that has this new property that you desire, and you can cross it with the elite variety that you're currently growing. When you do this, a half of the genes come from the elite variety, and a half of the genes come from the new variety. 
And you end up with what we call the first hybrid. The gene we want is the blue gene. You then end up with something that is a long way removed from the elite variety, because then the elite variety has many genes that we want. And so now you start back crossing. So you take the first hybrid and cross it to the elite variety, and then select the hybrid that comes out that has the gene you want. And you keep doing this over and over and over again until you get rid of as many of the genes from the original variety on the right, the related variety with the desired trait, so that you end up with the desired trait and as few extra genes as possible from the wild variety. This you can do, but it's a very long and tedious process. It can take anywhere from 10 to 30, 40 years of breeding before you can get to this. And so what the agribusinesses did was to focus on plants that sell well, on foods that sell well in the West. They weren't interested in foods that perhaps fed the developing world because there was no money to be made there. You made the money in the West. Now another thing that happens with conventional breeding is if you can't get what you want by crossing the plants, then you mutagenize them. You treat them with x-rays, you treat them with chemicals to make mutants that perhaps have the desired property that you want. But of course the problem with that is you don't just get the mutant with the property you want, you get a lot of other mutations too. We don't bother about that. that that's not considered an issue. Now what about the GMO approach? The GMO approach says, I know the gene that I want. I can put that onto this agrobacterium plasmid and I can allow agrobacterium to move it into the plant. This was the process, it's a natural process that Mark Van Montague discovered. Now of course, it doesn't usually move the gene that you want to put there, it moves the gene that agrobacterium wanted. But if you change the gene that it wants to put in to the one that you want it to put in, this will work. And so now you have a way of taking just one gene that you want and move it into the plant so that it will improve the quality of the plant. This is the GMO method. It's a precise method. It's a way in which you don't put a lot of unwanted genes in. You know exactly which gene has gone into it and we can now map it and know exactly where it went. And in fact, with the modern methods, CRISPR that's just come out recently, you can actually move it in one step to exactly the place you want it to go. Now Greenpeace say this first method, which results in a lot of things that you don't want, this is perfectly safe. Why? Because we've been doing it for 10,000 years, or at least we've been doing it for a couple of hundred years. But because we've been doing it for a long time, it's considered safe. This other method, which is precise, where you know what you're doing, this is dangerous. It doesn't make any sense. Let me give you an analogy in case you didn't follow this. Let's say I've got a car with a GPS system in it, my old car. I buy a new car, and I want to put the GPS system into my new car. What do I do? Do I take the two cars apart? mix all the parts up, and then select the version that got the GPS? Well, no. I disconnect the GPS, and I put it into my new car. That is the precision way of doing things. That is the GMO method. Taking them apart and mixing everything, that is conventional breeding. Now, one thing that Greenpeace would have you believe is that if you took the GPS from an airplane, Instead of getting just a GPS, the GPS, the car would now fly. They tell you if you take the gene from a salmon, maybe you have to worry that the plants are going to start swimming away. I mean, can you imagine what nonsense this is? And yet, they were successfully able to convince a significant part of the European public that this was a problem. This was something, this was a danger you had to worry about. And really, the key message here is that what is important is the product. It doesn't really matter how you get it. What's important is the product safe or is it not safe? 
The method tells you nothing about the potential safety. I like to think of this version. Think of a production line. This is a way of making a vehicle that will move. What's going to come out of there? Well, because it's maybe a GMO method, it's automatically going to be dangerous. But the bottom line is that maybe you're making a car and making, maybe you're making a tank, right? It depends on the product. It's not the way you made it, it's the product that is important. Now, you have to realize that plants are very different from ours. When we were living out in the jungle in Africa and a lion came along, we could run away. Plants can't run away when the insects come along and try to eat them. So what do they do? Well, they develop pesticides. They develop compounds that will kill the bugs that try to eat them. And I like to use this example of how this can lead to problems caused by conventional breeding. Think about celery. I'm sure all of you in the room have eaten celery at some point. Celery is good tasting stuff. It's been bred perfectly naturally. However, celery contains within it a lot of pesticides. The one at the top, 5,8-methoxysorolin, is actually not just a pesticide, it's also a carcinogen. And if you eat enough of it, you will run into trouble. And this was discovered because ladies who used to be chopping up celery to package it so that it could be sold in the supermarkets were getting celery juice all over their hands. And they discovered they were developing a contact dermatitis as a result of that. In some cases, they got skin cancer. This was because of the methoxysorolin. That was a GMO, you would not be allowed to sell it. But in fact, it's not a GMO, it's a naturally bred plant, but it's never tested to see if there's a problem. And it turns out there isn't a problem. It's perfectly safe to eat celery because the amounts of sorolin are very small. You really have to bathe in the juices before you have a problem. And the quantities are so low that your body is naturally able to detoxify it and take care of the problem. But again, if it was a GMO, you would not be allowed to sell it. So we have to ask, how did this antipathy, how did this anti-GMO movement get going? Now, we know that Africa, South America, Asia, places need better crops. And there's been very little effort put into growing and breeding better crops in these countries. Europe doesn't need them. So why doesn't Europe, why didn't they just say, this is great, you should be doing this, let's help the developing countries grow more food. Why didn't they do that? The question at the bottom is, say, could it be politics, or could it be money, or both? And the answer is, it was both. What happened is that Europeans, in general, across society, were very unhappy in the way that the big agribusinesses were conducting their business. They were interested in money and profit and would do anything in order to get profit. When Monsanto first introduced a GM crop into Europe, they did it in such a way that they made a lot of money for themselves, the farmers made a little bit of money, and the consumers were asked to pay more for it, and they got no extra benefit. Does that sound to you like a good business strategy? No, it was stupid. And I, you would have thought that any company that had a, an inkling of how to market a product would have known this. But Monsanto were interested in money. And this caused a lot of problems. So how are you going to stop the big companies from taking over the European food supply? Well, you could ban Monsanto. But of course, you can't actually ban Monsanto because they provide all the seeds that the European farmers use. And so what did they do? The Green parties realized that GMOs could be the answer. They could say Monsanto are coming along, they're providing these GMOs, we don't know if they're safe or not, so we will ban GMOs. So 
you tell them, well, this precision agriculture, this GMO method, you know, it's not been going on for very long. We don't know whether it might be dangerous. Maybe there are unforeseen consequences. And so they started spending a lot of money on advertising, on false advertising about the dangers. Not completely false, we didn't really know. When, when these methods first came along, it was reasonable to be cautious. And the Europeans, of course, believe in the precautionary principle, um, except when it affects their business, but they believe in the precautionary principle. And so you could have some sympathy for the fact that when Greenpeace first came along and said, well, maybe these are dangerous, maybe we should do some experiments and find out whether they're dangerous or not. A lot of people didn't like that, but nevertheless, it was not a completely unreasonable argument. We're now 30 years later. We have unbelievable amounts of scientific evidence saying there is not a single demonstrated example of a problem from GMOs. There have been billions of people who have eaten these compounds. There are cattle, all the food that goes to cattle, to pigs, and so on, is all GMO. And Europe is quite happy to buy this. They don't care about the animals having all these problems. It's apparently only humans. And so the best thing that came to them was that, well, if we ban GMOs, this has no economic consequence for Europe at all. And so they started to conflate this idea. If you were against Monsanto, you should be against GMOs. And it became an easy sell. They're very good at advertising. But one of the problems was that, well, you can't really pretend these things are dangerous for Europe, but they're okay for the rest of the world that needs them. And so they go around with these advertising, trying to stop it, not just in Europe, but around the rest of the world, and especially in Africa. They've, in the Philippines, have done a wonderful job of trying to stop developments here. Let's look at the science, just briefly summarized here, every major scientist in the world who is a member of these organizations, the Royal Society, the National Academies. There are some 200 and more National Academies that have come out and said these things are safe. There are only two societies that have come out and said that they're dangerous. They're listed on the right-hand side. And these are not really scientific societies. The one at the top is run by a man called Jeffrey Smith, who has no scientific background whatsoever. But they're just groups of people who they gathered together, in some cases doctors who didn't know better, form these societies to try and stop GMOs. No science involved in any of these things that is worthwhile. The scientists know that they're safe. So I want to just go through very briefly the golden rice story and then one or two more. Now, when you look at worldwide problems, a major problem in young children in the developing countries is vitamin A deficiency. Somewhere between 1.9 and 2.7 million children either go blind or develop sufficiently bad growth defects because the autoimmune system needs, the immune system needs vitamin A in order to develop your eyes properly, you need vitamin A. If you don't get enough, you have major problems. The guess is somewhere close to two million children die every year because they don't get enough vitamin A. Ingo Petrikus and Peter Bayer in Europe thought we can do something about this. They recognized that in many parts of the world, people are eating rice. Rice does not have any beta carotene in it, which is the precursor of vitamin A. And so they said, well, or at least not in the grain. It's got it in the stems, but not in the grain that you eat. And they said, well, let's persuade rice to start making beta carotene and put it into the grain. They did this. In 1999, they had successfully transferred some genes that could make beta carotene into a strain of rice. Not perfect, but it was a start. And typically what happens in a case like this with traditional breeding is that you start to put this out into the field, you start to grow it, you start to try and improve it, 
using standard breeding techniques as well as, as other methods. Greenpeace immediately went after this, and they did everything they could to stop it. And they put out this brochure, I think this was 2013, right? Golden illusion, they call golden rice. And their argument went as follows, that it has taken so long to develop golden rice and get it into the hands of people that it can't possibly work. They didn't happen to mention that they had put a roadblock in place at every conceivable point while it was being developed. I, I, I find this outrageous, just outrageous. Since 2002, more than 15 million children have died. 15 million. Just imagine if that had been a, a genocide in Rwanda. You'd only need to kill a couple of thousand and the world would be up in arms about it. If 15 million, no one cares. Particularly Greenpeace don't care. I call this a crime against humanity. Now, one thing that I would really like to say at this point is that if you've got an organization that is anti-GMO, tells you that it's dangerous, I want to know why they don't stop the GM production of human insulin. Human insulin is the product of a genetically modified organism. It's the product of a yeast into which the human insulin gene has been placed. Why aren't they opposed to that? Well, I can tell you, they know that the diabetics in this world would really tear them to pieces if they tried to stop that. It's a pharmaceutical. Vitamin A is a pharmaceutical too. Vitamin A is incredibly important for the development of plants. And I think Greenpeace realized that if they couldn't stop golden rice, perhaps this is going to be the end of the campaign because people will realize this is a good thing, this is something that's helping people to survive who would otherwise die, just like human insulin. Let me just tell you one or two quick cases. There is a major problem with bananas. I'm sure we all like bananas. I see them on every table uh, um, that I've eaten at so far here in the Philippines. Bananas have problems. Bananas have been so heavily developed by traditional techniques that they're actually pretty weak. They're pretty hard to work with in traditional methods. And in Uganda and in other parts of sub-Saharan Africa, there is a disease called Xanthomonas wilt. This is a bacterial disease, grows on the banana plants and destroys them, and there is no natural resistance to this. There are some 400 odd strains of bananas, the whole world's representation of wild bananas in a vault in Belgium. They've all been tried to see if they had genes that would stop Xanthomonas wilt, none of them did. However, it turns out that sweet pepper has two genes in it that will kill and stop Xanthomonas wilt from developing. Scientists in Kenya have put these two genes into bananas, and now there is a Xanthomonas wilt resistant banana. The Ugandans get 30% of their calories from bananas. 30% of the calories in their food come from bananas. Imagine what would happen if the crop disappears, and it is disappearing. In many places, they can't grow it anymore. There is now a bill going through the legal system, the parliamentary system in Uganda, which would allow the development of this. Um, it still has a way to go, though, before it's going to get there. Another big problem here is something called the fall army worm. This is a worm, caterpillar, it eats corn. It caused major devastation in the southern part of the USA many years ago. And what happened was the plant breeders developed a form of corn using GMO methods in which they took a natural pesticide called BT toxin. It comes from a bacterium, it's called Bacillus thuringiensis toxin. This is a toxin that the organic farmers spray all over their crops and that you have to wash off if um, you're concerned about it when you're cooking these. In fact, it's not a problem. It's not toxic, it doesn't affect humans, 
You can put it in your mouth and eat it and it's not a problem. So the anti-GMO people say, well, <coughs> it's okay if you spray it on the plants, but you cannot put it into the plant where you end up getting almost nothing by the time you eat it. And it stops the fall armyworm. And corn, all of the corn grown in the southern part of the US at the moment is BT corn. This has also spread elsewhere. I know some of it is grown here in the Philippines. In South Africa, they grow it. But in these countries, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Namibia, Malawi, the government, the president of these countries decided it was a GMO because Greenpeace got to them and said, no, we won't grow it. And so they're losing thousands upon thousands of hectares of corn because they won't, they're not allowed to grow this BT resistant crop. <coughs> in Bangladesh, they did the same thing. They put this BT gene into eggplant, call it brinjal. BT brinjal has been a tremendous success in Bangladesh. The farmers love it, they make money on it, you've got better, better looking fruit, you have more fruit coming out. And in fact, it's been so successful, the Bangladeshis are having a hard time eating everything they grow. And now the farmers in Assam have been going over to Bangladesh and getting seeds so they can grow them too, even though this is banned in India. Farmers are actually rather smart. Um, they know what they need in order to grow the foods that they need to make the profits that they need to carry on. Hawaiian papayas is another example. And this is a good one. I like this one especially because in Hawaii, some 20 odd years ago, they had a major problem from something called ring spot virus. This was a virus carried by an insect, got into the papaya trees, and would kill the papaya plants. And the farmers didn't know what to do. But a man named Dennis Gonsalves, who worked at the University of Hawaii, developed using GM methods a papaya plant that was resistant to ring spot virus. Farmers loved it, they started growing it as soon as they possibly could, and now something like 70 to 80 percent of all of the papayas grown in Hawaii are GMO papayas. Then some politician had a great idea. You probably know about this idea that we should label GMO containing foods. This started in the USA, it was something that the organic farmers decided was a good idea uh, because they felt if you've got to test all of your foods to see if it's got a GMO in it, it's going to raise the cost of regular food. And now the price differential between regular food and organic food wouldn't look quite so bad and people won't mind paying the extra. Okay? They spent $50 million advertising the need to be labeling GMO plants. Why did they do it? Look at the money. When, you know, you want to know why people do things these days, almost all of them do it for the money. You don't have to dig very far in order to find this. You should look at Greenpeace's finances. In Europe, the best estimate, they don't, they don't actually reveal the figure, the best estimate is they uh, bring in about 500 million euros a year. This is an NGO. This is Greenpeace. This anti-GMO movement has been the best fundraising scheme they ever had. There's never been one as good. They don't want to give that up. So, let's return to the Hawaiian story for a moment. So, when the government decided, yes, this is a good idea, we'll put in a GMO labeling law. As soon as the farmers heard about this, they were up in arms. They say, people won't buy our papayas anymore and we'll go out of business. They had meetings, they protested, all sorts of things. And the government in Hawaii realized they had a problem. And so what did they do? They said, ah, we have the solution. We will only demand things be labeled if they're newly made. Anything that's old, like the papayas, we won't label them. We, we don't have to say they're GMOs. We can pretend they're not because they've been around for so long. Does that sound like political tricks that, that you come across? Just disgusting. So, food choice is really something that is very good for the developed world. You go into the supermarket, you can pick what you want. 
Okay, you, you don't have to go and buy this that doesn't look very nice because there's nothing else. You've got a choice. But if you don't want to buy GMOs, don't buy them. But don't pretend they're dangerous because that sends exactly the wrong message. And if anything, GMO foods are going to be safer than conventionally bred foods for the simple reason that the conventional breeding brings in loads of genes, loads of stuff you don't know what's in it, the GMOs, you know exactly what is in it. For developed countries, food isn't a problem. But when we make political stances or take out advertisements and tell people about things, we must remember that whatever we say, we hear it around the world. You can't pretend that something's dangerous in Europe, but it's perfectly OK in the developing world. Okay? And so this is what Greenpeace has been doing, going out and telling the developing world, you shouldn't be doing this, you shouldn't be feeding yourself. We need a lot more science in politics. We need the politicians to understand the science, not at a high level, but just at a very basic level, so they can make sensible decisions. And it'd be quite nice if we had less politics in science also. So politicians, they should listen to the scientists that they fund. You know, why do they fund us if they don't want to listen to the results that we find? Climate change is probably the greatest example of this. 95% of scientists say climate change is caused by human activity. Okay? The politicians don't want to listen. We should stop supporting the idea that foods produced by GMOs are inherently dangerous. The science has shown that they're not. There's not a single thing that one should be worried about at that at this point. Not to say there's never going to be a problem, but there is no evidence for a problem. I could tell much scarier stories about traditionally bred plants than I ever could about GMO plants. Oh, down here, where are we? Yeah. Let, let's, this is something that is especially deserving. This is something the EU puts out a report on a regular basis, and now the Green Parties are trying to have them include this clause that said members of the G8 should stop supporting GMO research in Africa. Here you've got the Europeans trying to recolonize Africa. Absolutely terrible. I think civil society can play its role too. Um, major religious leaders, we're trying to get the Pope to make a statement. This is something that would have a worldwide effect. He believes in the science. He's convinced the science is okay, but he's been fed some false information by an economist in Argentina that he respects who claims that in Argentina, when the big agribusinesses started growing GM plants, they took the smallholders out of business and took their land and destroyed the poor people. Problem is, this was happening long before GMOs came along. The big agribusiness had been doing this for years. Um, I've been trying to get to this Argentinian economist. He refuses to talk to me. But I might also say the leaders of Greenpeace refuse to talk to me also. Groups such as the Rotary Clubs can be immensely um, influential. They are actually very interested in the poor people and the um, lesser affluent people in their societies. I've been talking to Rotary Clubs close to where I work. The very first time I went and gave my talk, a lady came up to me after the talk, and she said, well, I was anti-GMO, she said, but having heard you talk, I'm now pro-GMO, and I'm going to try and get this on the agenda of Rotary International. I think you in this audience, go and talk to your local Rotary Clubs. Tell them the GMO story, too but tell them about science in general. They can be very supportive. The media should support science facts, not science fiction. You know, the media always likes to present every story as here's the good, here's the bad, 50-50. This is not a 50-50 story. This is a 99 to 1 story. They should say it the way it is. I love this one. This is the one really positive thing that has come out from the Vatican. They, every so often, put out statements saying, you know, if you're going to celebrate 
um, Christian rituals, Catholic rituals, some things you can do, some you can't do. The Eucharistic matter, the bread that you eat when you go to Mass, if it contains, if it's gluten-free, has no gluten in it, no matter how that happened, no good, doesn't work apparently. You, you might, maybe you should make note of that. However, if the bread is made from a GMO organism, it's okay. Spelled out clearly here in blue. If you make it with genetically modified organisms, it's okay. This is the most optimistic thing I've heard out of the Vatican in a long time. It's terrific. And i like to close with this. And that is, just have a heart. When you're going to make decisions about supporting or not supporting GMOs, have a heart. Think about these kids in Africa who go to bread, bed hungry every night. They need food. They're never going to get the food they need by traditional methods, but they can get it by using GMO methods. It's easy to do GMO methods. Almost everybody, every plant lab in the West would love to invite scientists from third world countries to come in, learn how to do it, go back and do it for themselves. They don't need to be technically, terrifically um, talented in order to do it. It's easy, this stuff, and it gets easier all the time. And this is something that I think we really need to get the message out. And I'm actually just composing an op-ed piece at the moment in which I'm going to suggest that the leaders of African countries should realize that this is the Europeans trying to colonize them again. Okay? This is the European trying to dictate what goes on in Africa. I say they should resist. They should tell the Europeans to go to hell and manage their own affairs. They should do what's good for Africa, not what is good for Europe and told to them by Europe. And at the bottom, there is a website called supportprecisionagriculture.org. This is the website, the official website of the Nobel laureates. It lists the 138 names that have signed on, but you can sign on too. If you go to the website, there's a lot of information about this. And if you're with me, just put your name down and sign on. We're gathering signatures wherever we possibly can. So I'm sorry to go on so long, but I feel this is a story that it is incredibly important to tell, and it's one that you don't hear as often as you should. So thank you very much for the honorary degree and for listening. remain standing for the UP Naming Mahal, UP Hymn, The Exit of Colors, and The Recessional.
Thank mm-hmm. you.